He is risen. Oh, yes. I wondered whether it would happen, and it did. Oh, amen. He has risen. Oh, happy Easter. And um, how joyous, joyous it is to have the hope that we have in Christ. We have hope. We have future because of what Jesus did. He didn't just die. He rose again. And um, he is seated now at the right hand of the Father. Amen. How amazing is our God that he did that for us. So let's stand and let's praise him. For he is worthy of all our praise. Alive in you. Welcome to church. Welcome if you're new and visiting, and welcome at home if you are online. My name is Janelle, and um, we trust that this morning you will have ears that hear and a heart that hears what God has to say to you. 
And I want to read to you this verse. And it's in Psalm 40, verses 2 and 3. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. So let's trust in the Lord for Jesus paid it all. We just have a slight problem. Oh no, found it. Okay. Sorry. No worries at all. Sin had left 
blood washed us clean and we say thank you and we pray Lord that you would speak to us this morning may we not leave here the same but may we be changed in Jesus name amen thank you please be seated thank you pastor Cam who will bring us the announcements on. Good morning all. My name is Cam. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to all. Welcome to those at home. We've only got a few announcements. Unfortunately, we're still in, still in COVID, but um, the uh, lockdown was lifted so we can meet, meet here, and that's great. Um, I'm not wearing my mask because I can't talk through the mask, but I've got one back at my seat, so everyone else has got a mask. That's good. Uh, men's camp is still on at Barallan at the end of this month uh, and the first weekend of next month. Anyone wants to go to that, please see our elder Daryl Harper. The, um, we have communion today. Have you all picked up a communion kit on the way in? Andrew will explain how to open those when he, uh, when he comes up to give communion. We are, we're not taking up an offering anymore, as you are well aware, through COVID. There is an ice cream container up the back for, for those that still, still bring cash. Uh, but otherwise, direct debit or uh, online banking can... Uh, can be used. So we're going to pray now for uh, for the blessings that we've had and the blessings that we can bestow. But I'm going to reiterate what Janelle has said. He is risen. This is the this is the day that that changed the world. Certainly, it's the it's the most important day on the Christian calendar, and. Uh, we, it's a great day to be together and celebrate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this incredible, incredible opportunity. The opportunity that you've given to us, that you've displayed, that you've manifested in the form of, of Jesus. Jesus who came, who chose to go to the cross, who chose as a sinless person and the, the Son of God who chose to take the sin of the world, our sin, upon his own shoulders, to be the sacrificial lamb and to give us the opportunity to be cleansed through his sacrifice. It, but it was a choice. He struggled with that choice in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he was arrested and taken away. And we just look on in awe and wonder at why, at why he would bother. But he, he, he made the choice and we are the winners. So thank you, Lord. Our Lord Jesus gave everything to us and for us as we contemplate our, our capacity to give let us think outside the, uh, outside the box let us be more generous than we've thought ourselves capable of being as we've been blessed Help us to bless others above and beyond 
what we've done before. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, does anyone remember the Russian version of Christ is risen, he's risen indeed? My family does. Every year I have to put you all through this. It is Christ is risen, but in Russian it's Christos Voskres, and he is risen indeed is Voyistina Voskres. So I say Christos Voskres, and you say back, because you've got a mask on, you need to say it extra loud. Has everyone got it? Let's have a practice. Uh, you're going to say, Go. Voyistina Voskres. Again. Now, uh, break through the mask barrier. Voyistina Think Russian, think big, think loud. Here we go, one more time, practice. Okay, uh, here we go. I'm gonna say Christos Voskres and you're gonna shout back Voistina Voskres. Here we go. Christos Voskres. Excellent work. Uh, it's time for communion and you should have one of these if you're in the room, if you're at home you're going to have to supply your own elements. So you need to get them ready. If you have those in the room, uh, you will notice that there's two, two wrappings you need to undo. The first one you need to undo is a transparent wrapping. There is like a, a shaped, a pointed shape. If you find that, then get the clear bit. And if you pull the clear bit carefully, you'll keep the liquid covered and you'll expose the biscuit. Have a go at doing that now and then we'll get this show on the road. Such as they are. Don't expose the liquid yet, you might end up in trouble. It was the 50th day after the first Easter and something incredible happened. Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times, stood in the temple to preach. The Holy Spirit had descended on the apostles and they began to speak in the many languages of the Jewish pilgrims who'd come to Jerusalem from all over the world for the feast of Pentecost. Many in the crowd assumed that the apostles were drunk and Peter rose to proclaim that it was because of Jesus, the one who they'd killed just 50 days earlier, he was the one, he was raised from the dead and he was pouring out what they could now see and hear. He came to the conclusion of his sermon as I read from Acts chapter 2. He said, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, that's Jesus, both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I want you to understand that for Peter, there was a package deal. There was the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name and there was a gift of the Spirit who was promised to come. 
There was the forgiveness for our past sins and there is also the power to live for God in the present and also in the future. It is Resurrection Sunday. We tend to link the forgiveness of our sins to Calvary and Good Friday. We tend to associate repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins to Friday, but we neglect the great package deal, that that's only half the story. There is something else that is associated with today, Easter Sunday, and that is the resurrection of Jesus, and associated to his resurrection is the coming of the Spirit. It was in resurrection that Jesus attained a new level and from that level he distributes the spirit into our lives we should be thinking of this package deal not only the forgiveness of sins but also the coming of the spirit every easter forgiveness of sins and newness of life death and resurrection go together Imagine Easter as just Good Friday with no Easter Sunday. But imagine Easter with a Good Friday that's followed by an Easter Sunday. The forgiveness of sins plus the newness of life. No better day than today than to remember new life in Jesus, forgiveness and also resurrection, the coming of the Spirit. I'm going to pray and then we'll share in this little wafer thing together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great opportunity to remember what you've done. It is in the room here a simple wafer. I don't know what the people at home have, but it is for us to represent Jesus' broken body. But we don't want to separate this out as though there's something called forgiveness and forget about the newness of life. They go together. And Lord, as we eat and remember that Jesus died, we pray that you'd help us to appreciate the new life that we have as well as a consequence of the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we commit this time and our sharing of this, uh, this ceremony together to your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's eat of the biscuit together. And now we're going to open the cup. You have to get the alfoil tab and lift that. It's a little bit tight. Uh, be careful that you don't squeeze the cup in trying to pull it off. You may get yourself with a bit of splashing there. It is a bit tight. You don't need to pull it all the way off. Just expose it and then you can just drink. And let's drink together. Lord, we thank you that you have instructed us to remember you. We are always mindful of the fact of sins forgiven and new life by your spirit. Thank you for this opportunity to remember this and to do this simple ceremony all together. Lord, and I pray for those at home who participated as well and thank you that they have the opportunity to join us in that way. And so, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, these now are rubbish. Don't forget to put them in the bin on the way out.
Let's stand and sing this next song, The Lion and the Lamb. Jesus, thank you that we have new life in you because of what you did and that today we remember that you rose. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Christos vos cres. Uh, look, if I told you the story about that, I'm sure I would have, because I do it every year, but it's just it shows you how much you can remember from year to year. Not much, 
Uh, but there was, uh, when I was a young Christian, I went to the Belgrave Heights Convention down in Melbourne. Uh, we took a bus from Adelaide and went over to the Belgrave Heights Keswick Convention in Melbourne. Huge, big affair. Fantastic thing. It was an interesting story, very significant trip for us. Not the least of which was because on the way home, we stopped at a roadhouse in a big bus. We took a whole youth group on a big bus and we went across, we stopped at a roadhouse and then took off and about half an hour, 45 minutes later down the road, somebody he said, where's so-and-so? We'd left someone at the roadhouse. Great, not what you want to do when you're on uh, these days with, you know, workplace health and safety and all that kind of thing. You're just a bit of a no-no. But we left the kid at the roadhouse. There you go. Uh, anyway, at the Belgrave Heights Convention, there was a Russian speaker called Reverend Andrew Semenchuk. We called him Andrew Cement Truck because he was about, he appeared to be eight foot tall and about 10 foot around, and he had a huge Russian voice. And he spoke like that. And when he preached, he preached a sermon on the second coming, and everyone was actually shaking in his boots, shaking in their boots as he went, he's coming back. And everyone went, he just kept it his huge voice. And anyway, he sang a song in the middle of a sermon as well. That was fantastic. And he also taught us to say, Christos vos cres, voistina vos cres. And with it, he had a story. It was actually part of one of his messages. It was an illustration of when the communist regime took over in Russia and they were trying to eliminate faith out of all of the peoples in Russia. They came to a town and they would set up in the town hall or whatever they have in Russia. I don't know what places they have, but they had this public meeting there and all the people from the central office in Moscow were there. There were PhDs and all these people that have on the platform and they were trying to present to the peasants that there was no God, that religion was bad and that they should all be communists. You know what Russia is like. And so they had this thing there and all the peasants, they can't argue with all the PhDs on the stage. They had nothing to say and they had this Q&A at the end and nobody was saying anything, nobody was doing anything and everyone on the stage was thinking, well, we've actually convinced all of these people that their religion is bogus and everything's, everything's useless for them to continue in their worship and all that kind of stuff. They were sort of celebrating when a little old man came forward as though he had a question. And he came up to the front and he stood to ask a question. What's your question, sir? And the man just stood there and said, Christos vos cres. And everyone shouted back, Voistina vos cres. And that was the end of the meeting. And what a great story. That's why I always say, Christos vos cres. Never forget it. We're going to read John chapter 16, the first 16 verses. And for those of you who are timing, that story is not a part, official part of the sermon. I have sent all these things to you to keep you from falling away. All this usual stuff, you can find this on the Bible app if you want. I've sent all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And they'll do these things because they've not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when their hour comes, you will remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now we're up to speed. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. 
I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while and you'll see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. I think I'm going to stop there, even though there's more there. We'll just stop there. Let's all pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, these last few weeks and leading up to Easter, we've been talking about love on the stretch because of Jesus' words in John chapter 13. I don't even have them there. That's how bad it is. Uh, you know, when Jesus, it says, before the feast of the Passover, knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And we've been taking that to mean he loved them to the uttermost or he showed them the full extent of his love, love stretched out to its divine limit. And so the teaching and the activities that follow from this uh, upper room discourse describe the extent of Jesus' love. And there's great significance for us as we come on Easter Sunday to speak in this way because we're going to touch on the ministry of the Spirit. We've already seen that Jesus spoke of going on a journey. He described it as departing to the Father. I'm about to leave, he kept saying. And he did say, if you remember, that it was a journey that he would have to take alone. Nobody could go with him. The Jewish, uh, the Pharisees couldn't come. His own disciples couldn't come. Nobody could come. He was departing to the Father and he would have to do it alone. It was a journey that took him to come Calvary took him to death and then to resurrection and on into the ascension. And so we understand that on the cross, we see divine love shown in giving itself for the sins of others, but there's more to God's love than that. Just as surely as Good Friday is not the last word of the Easter holidays, there is an Easter Sunday that came after the death a resurrection to newness of life. God's love means so much more than just the forgiveness of our sins. As wonderful as that is, that's only half of the story. There is also new life by the Spirit. Forgiveness of sins and newness of life. You must have both. In fact, they go together. In John chapter 14, there are two fulcrums upon which this love of God has been displayed. And all of you here listening and also in the room should be seeing this as a bit of revision. All that I'm saying now, it's all revision. I, you know, it's got under my here, I've got introduction, but it's actually revision. John 14, 2, in my father's house are many rooms are many resting places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And so in my father's house, in relationship with my father, there are many places of rest. Jesus was going to prepare it. That's, he was going to make a propitiation or an expiation. He was going to die on the cross for our sins. And we in coming to faith would then find rest in the father as his sacrifice forgives us of our sins. All the anxiety, all the distress, all the impact of sin on our lives taken care of by Christ, we come and we find rest. That is love 
love of Christ laying down his life for us, his friends. But it's only half the story. We find that Jesus didn't just die for our sins, he died with a view to us becoming the resting place of God. If anyone loves me, the he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our, and that's that same word that's rooms in chapter 14 verse 2 and it's home here in verse 23. It's a resting place. It's a dwelling place. Jesus didn't just die for our forgiveness. He died so that when we were forgiven, we could become the very resting place of God. You remember in this? Yeah? Uh, excitement plus. We looked at Matthew chapter 11. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. Ah, that's a bit disappointing. And, and, anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. And so Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so there is a unique relationship between Jesus and the Father. The Son and the Father have a unique relationship. No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And so come to me and I'm going to give you rest. We understand that our rest is to be introduced to the Father. And there is then a reciprocal relationship of rest, us in God and he in us. And it is an incredible thing to think about that we find rest in God. That's incredible in and of itself, but it's even more incredible to think that God himself, the creator of heaven and earth, he finds rest in us. And the purpose of Calvary is not personhood, it's not just in our direction, it is in the direction of God who is looking for a place to rest. The whole purpose of creation, the whole purpose of people is found in the gospel in God is looking to make a people for himself, a people in whom and with whom he can dwell. And so on the day of Pentecost when Peter was preaching and the people were cut to the heart and asked, what are we going to do? And Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. We talked about it at communion. We've got Calvary and we've also got the coming of the Spirit. It's Resurrection Sunday. And so here we have these two ideas together that we come on Good Friday and have our sins forgiven. We come on Easter Sunday and we have the Spirit coming who brings God's presence into our lives. When describing the resurrection of Christ, Paul compared it to the coming of life or the coming to life of the first man, Adam. He said the first man became a living soul and then he said the last man, the purpose of it all, Christ, he became a life-giving spirit. And so in his resurrection, Jesus becomes the dispenser of life. He becomes the the giver of the Spirit. And so when we come to Christ and find rest, it is the Spirit who comes and dwells within, and the Spirit is God. And when we come to Christ, we've come to God, and when we talk of receiving the Spirit, He adds nothing. Come to Christ, you've come to God, and there's nothing more to get. You don't receive the Father at some stage and then the Spirit later. It's all wrapped up in Christ. The Trinity is one. Come to Jesus. And we know where Jesus is. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But he says, if you obey me, we, the Father and I, we will come and make our home with you. How are they doing that? By the coming of the Spirit. You can't chop the Trinity up. Three is one. One is three. We learned it at school in maths. So when you come to Christ and you find rest, 
It's the Spirit who comes and brings all that God is to dwell in you. So God's absolute display of love is us finding rest in God, that's Calvary, but Him also coming and finding rest in us. That's Easter Sunday, that's the coming of the Spirit. Still going on revision. Is this all all right? Good. It's the work of the Spirit to bring all that God is into our lives. As we read in between those two words, remember there's that word, the rooms, in verse 2 and in verse 23. It's the only place it's used in all the New Testament. It's a significant thing that there are two of them and that they're both in John chapter 14. And in between, we read this. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments and I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper, another counselor, another comforter. We'll talk about which word to use in a minute. He's going to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I'm in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I'll love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not the bad one, said to him, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to everyone else? Huh? And Jesus answered him, well, if anyone loves me, he's going to keep my word. My father will love him, we'll come to him and we'll make our home with him. That's how. Now, we believe that Jesus is going to physically return to this earth, that he's going to come again. I can't wait, because once we finish this love on the stretch business, and by the way, there's one more week to go after this. Once we finish that, we're going back to the book of Revelation, and we'll get to talk about Jesus is coming back to the earth again. He really is going to return, and everyone will see that. But here in the upper room, what Jesus is talking about is talking about a coming to the obedient and finding rest within by a person that he's calling the comforter. And I hope it's clear to you now that he's not talking about his second coming. He's talking about the coming, his presence via the agency of the Spirit in the lives of the people who will obey. That's what he's talking about here. Does everyone got that? Is that clear? Wow. So when Jesus said, because I live, you will live, he was talking about completing his lonely journey to the Father through death at Calvary and onto resurrection and from the right hand of the Father, sending the Spirit to bring us life. Because I live, you will live. He became a life-giving spirit. And the spirit's presence brings life and is also, can I say, permanent. There's nowhere in the New Testament where the spirit is removed. Let's move on. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the Spirit comes, he's an indweller who brings us to God, he's a teacher and he shows us how to live out the life of Christ. And today we're going to be talking about that and we're going to focus on one aspect and that is the ministry of witness. See, when the helper comes, verse 26 of chapter 15, who I send from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning and so the spirit has this comforter this helper has a ministry of witness it's a ministry of witness to Christ and chapter 16 goes on to describe this witness more fully but before we talk about that I want to just go through and I'm sure I've taught you this before 
why I think we should use the word comforter to describe the Spirit in these passages. Our translations really struggle to know how to translate this word that is in the old versions translated as comforter. They have counsellor, they have helper. I don't know what version you're using. Here we have helper in the ESV. But I think the old versions have it best. The best word is the word comforter. The trouble is all our American friends are thinking of dummies. And we may make the mistake of thinking of somebody who comes alongside and puts their arm around us and goes, oh, they're there, and gives us some comfort. I don't want it to mean either of those things. It means something that I think comes better when we understand the Old Testament use of the same word. I think the Old Testament word comfort is... is the basis of this New Testament word. The Old Testament meaning of this word, I think, clears it all up. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The Jews then translated it into Greek. And so when we come to understand the New Testament, we find that the Greek there often gets its meaning from the Hebrew Old Testament via the Greek Old Testament. And I think this word is one such as those. It was in 1947 when two Arabs were minding some goats in the rocky hills the goats were climbing up on the hills and the rocks this is around by the dead sea it came time to gather the goats up and go home when they noticed some holes in the rocks it's a cave and which young boys who find a cave don't go let's go in don't you want to have a look let's have a captain cook of course you want to go in and have a look. They couldn't get in. It was too narrow. So instead, they chucked some rocks in. Curiosity had them throw some rocks down and they heard the shattering of what seemed like, sounded like clay breaking at the bottom. They heard a crash. What they did realize is it wasn't too deep. So curiosity drove them down. They were hoping treasure chests and all that kind of stuff. But instead, when they got there, they discovered there were all these pots and jars. They were hoping gold, jewels and treasure, but the jars only contained manuscripts. They went home and they sold the manuscripts that they could carry. They sold them for a song and then people discovered that they were precious. So they were chopping them up and they were selling them for a bit more. Word then spread around Jerusalem about these manuscripts. The Jerusalem University heard about it. And then some people from the United States came with a lot of money and they ensure the preservation of those scrolls. Those manuscripts were the oldest extant manuscripts of the Bible. Now, Later, that year in November, they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way. Later that year, in November, the United Nations passed a resolution that enabled the founding of the State of Israel. And on May 15, 1948, they happened. Fresh, fresh from those scrolls, they had placed on a plate on the desk in front of every person in that parliament called the Knesset, placed in front of every member was a replica from those Dead Sea Scrolls and it was of the, the prophet Isaiah with these words in Hebrew, obviously. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And cry to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned, that she's received from the Lord's hands double for all of her sins. You see, for the Jewish nation, God had dug up the Dead Sea Scrolls and at the same time, he dug up the nation itself. And when the words were read, there was not a dry eye in that parliament. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says the Lord. What does it mean when it says comfort? Comfort. Well, if you look up the word, you find it's used a lot in the prophet Isaiah. 
you who fear all the trials of life will find comfort. I think written in Hebrew, translated into Greek, this word comfort is coming into the New Testament and the meaning of the New Testament derives its place here in the Old Testament. It actually means comfort. And if you read all the passages and you piece them all together, you find that there are three things involved. You find that God is gonna take away people's sins. You're gonna find that God's gonna bring joy and gladness to his people and you find that God is going to gain a victory on the people's behalf. And so when you're thinking of God bringing comfort, that's what you should be thinking of. God taking away sin, God bringing joy and gladness, and God gaining victory on the people's behalf. And so here we have, I think, this whole idea of comfort when you've got this concept of the comforter, the spirit bringing all that God is to us, we should be having those same three things in our minds the forgiveness of sins, a new level of daily experience of God, gladness and joy, and us entering into the victory of the Lord. You getting all of this? Oh, look, I've told you all this before. Comfort involves those three things. The taking away of sin, the bringing of gladness and joy, and the gaining victory on the people's behalves. Look, You don't need to know about Christmas. Perhaps we'll talk about it then. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I'm gonna ask the Father, he'll give you another comforter, one just like him. He's gonna be with you forever. If you really wanna summarize it down, you'd say a synonym for comfort is salvation. And we should understand it as operating in that Trinitarian way. What God the Father achieved for us in Jesus is applied to us by the Spirit. You getting all of this? Chapter 16 outlines the Holy Spirit's role as comforter. Okay? And when he comes, he's going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sins because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I think when we get this Old Testament background of this concept of comfort and we bring it in, we're seeing the same three things here. The removal of sin, the taking away of sin, there's a new level of living, an experience of God, and there's God's victory on our behalf. It's all wrapped up here in the work of the Spirit. It is the ministry of the comforter. And I wanna describe those three things for us on this Easter Sunday because this is life the conviction of sin he's going to convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me the spirit is going to convict us of sin Why? Because they don't believe in me. The Holy Spirit doesn't need to tell thieves that they are thieves and that it's wrong to be a thief. People who are adulterers don't need to to have the Spirit come and tell them that adultery is wrong. Murderers know that they've done it and that they shouldn't have. You don't need the Spirit to convince you what's right and wrong. Our consciences tell us those things. What the Spirit does need to do is to convince a person that they're going to be kept from heaven and continue on the road to hell simply because they do not have the proper connection to Jesus Christ, because they do not believe in him. That's the problem. They do not believe in me. And so he comes convicting sin. The truth we need to grasp is that all of our problems with sin are to be handled by Jesus. 
Jesus is the answer for our sins. And the work of the Spirit is to apply the power of the blood of Christ to your life, and it's the blood of Jesus which cleanses us from all sin. There is a sense which we're cleansed once and for all at our conversion, but we still sin, we still have greed, we still have pride, we still have envy, we still hold malice in our hearts towards others, and it is the Spirit who wants us to have the blood of Jesus's, um, the power of Jesus's blood applied to us to bring victory over sin in our lives. The Spirit doesn't need to condemn us. We're already condemned. He wants to bring us to Jesus to find forgiveness. And so we need to pray, search me, O God, know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me. You know, you and I, we do wrong things and the temptation is that we need to deal with it ourselves. The temptation is that we need to fix it on our own. You know, some of us, we we don't even have, and I think it's actually by that's some of us, that's preacher talk for all of us. We we don't even know the full extent of our own sins. We need God for that. It's what God thinks that matters. And the Spirit is at work, the Comforter. He wants to bring the power of the forgiveness of sins to bear in our lives. He makes us aware of the wrongs. He makes us aware of what God thinks of it, not to condemn us, but so that we will take them to Christ to find his forgiveness. The Spirit points us to Jesus, the place, the only place where we can find the forgiveness of sins. Don't think that you can fix them up on your own. He comes to convict of sin because we do not believe in him. He wants to bring us to believe in him. Next, he wants to convict of righteousness because I go to the Father and you're going to see me no longer. Now we know what Jesus is meaning when he says he's going to the Father. We're thinking about Calvary. We're thinking about the resurrection. We're thinking about the ascension. We're thinking about that lonely journey. That's what Jesus is talking about. And so he comes to convict of righteousness because Jesus is going to be gone. He set the standard of righteousness in Jesus by raising him from the dead. There's an ascension to his right hand. So we Christians stand in the righteousness of God. There's a status that we have that you can call righteous. Saints are actually holy. But what Jesus is on about here is not some standing that we have, but rather from his position of power, he is to work out his righteousness through us. If you want to know the victory of Jesus in your life, if you want to know the new life that he has, you should be displayed playing it in an outwardly righteous life. Jesus is going. Jesus is gone. And the Spirit will convict you of righteousness so that you will look to him for him to live out his righteousness in you. There should be a new level of the daily experience of God in your life. And so Christians should always be considering others as better than themselves. Christians should always be able to love the unlovely. Christians should always be able to have people press their buttons and them not react. 
The classic example for me is the example of Corrie ten Boom, who was held a captive in a concentration camp in the Second World War. She suffered the abuse from the guards. They held them captive in dormitories that were, were lice infested, flea infested. They weren't fed enough. They were made to stand out in the cold for hours on end. And they were there. They were abused by the guards. People were beaten. Most of them died. Many of them were just waiting to be taken to be killed in gas chambers. Miraculously, Corrie survived, but her sister didn't. And she grew in those, to- in those places. She grew what we would all think is okay. She started to hate the prison guards, as you would. They killed her sister. She, her father had died. Other family members were killed in the war as well. And so she grew a hate for them. And you and I would think that was perfectly justified. Then the story goes, Curry tells it herself, she returned from America after having been released. She traveled to America. She came back to Germany with her absolutely afraid that she would do and see things she did not want to go back to Germany. God led her there. She's speaking at a meeting there in shock of horrors. The worst thing that could have happened, somebody at one of her meetings, a Christian meeting, she recognized as one of the guards that held her in Ravensbrück, the concentration camp, and she hated him. She saw him, and at the end of the meeting, he approached her. And in her is hate. And she says, but God, you command me to love. And she said, I confess my lack of love. She's saying this to herself as a man is standing right in front of her. And she says, God... Forgive my hate. And I hold out my hand in faith that you will love. Fill me with your love for him. And as she describes it, when he took her hand, her feelings began to change. But not before. But not before. Do you understand that us living out a life of righteousness is simply the risen Christ living his life out through us via the agency of the Spirit? It's not up to you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. When the unlovely people are pressing your buttons, do you know where you should be looking? When somebody is late to pick you up and you're feeling frustrated and impatient, do you know where you should be looking? When the people that you love are pressing your buttons, and making you feel short-tempered and you're feeling a bit short and grumpy. Do you know where you should look? When you lack the courage to share your faith because you're shy and embarrassed, do you know where you should look? Do you know? When you find that you can't be all that God wants you to be, do you know where you should look? When you find that you keep doing the wrong things, you, you look, the very things that you know that you don't want to do, you end up keep doing them, and the very good things that you want to do, you can't keep doing them. Do you know where you should look? It is to the one who died on the cross for your sins, who rose from the dead and ascended to the Father, and from there has sent the great comforter who wants to bring the very presence of God, who wants to bring the experience of God, who wants to bring God himself into your life. 
He will live out his life through you. That is the secret of Christianity. That is why we should be different. That is why we are different. And it's all about the ministry of the comforter sent by Jesus into us. He convicts the world of righteousness because he's gone to the Father. We're not going to see him anymore. The comforter needs to bring his righteousness to bear in us. And he's going to convict of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Hmm. Notice it says not judgment to come. It says judgment past. You know, in Jesus, all evil was conquered and we stand in victory ground. It's the job of the spirit to convince us that the devil has been defeated. It's, it's, it's necessary because it doesn't always look like that that is the case. Sometimes it looks like there is an evil mind that's running this joint. Sometimes it looks like there's something behind all the bad stuff that's going on. Sometimes it looks like there's a whole lot of bad stuff going down in our lives and it looks like the devil is winning. You look at the virus. You look at the way it's impacting our world and our economy. You look at the way morality is on the slide. You can look at all of these things and you might start to think, you know what, it seems to me that the devil's actually winning. And you might be thinking the same thing in your own life. It seems as though to me that the devil's having a field day with me. But the truth is, he has been defeated. He was defeated at Calvary. And it's the ministry of the Spirit to convince you of that fact. It is the very message of the comfort in Isaiah 40. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. You don't need to fight the devil. You don't need, you don't need to be someone who's winning a battle. You need to be someone who is behind the one who has won the battle. All that has been achieved in Christ, the salvation of God is brought to bear in our lives via the agency of the Spirit. He is the comforter. And when Jesus was teaching this, can you hear, can you feel the wonder? This is love shown to the uttermost. It's a story that's way bigger than just Jesus laying his life down for us. It's this thing called salvation. It is the comfort of God himself. So, when we say, Christos vos cres, voistiona vos cres, there's this huge package it's not about us and being forgiven it's about God having a place to dwell it's about us living out God's life God living through us it's about God achieving a victory on our behalf and us knowing. So happy Easter. Happy Easter. Let's pray. Lord, what a privilege it is to be someone who participates in the wonder of this thing that we call salvation. For some of us, it's simply a funny feeling that we feel at church sometimes. And we feel like we need to put things right with you. But there's so much in what you've achieved for us, your plan, your package, that salvation is. Forgiveness of sins, newness of life. 
you living out your life within you making us aware of sins and what to do with them bring them to you and you convincing us that the devil is defeated help us to walk with you and this Easter may you remind us each one of the wonders of what your great journey achieved of departing to the Father and the blessing of sending the Comforter to us. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing through our masks, this final song, this great old hymn, Christ Arose. pray. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. He's alive in us. Help us this week to be great stewards of all that he's done and all that his great resurrection means. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christos was Chris. See you all next week.